We are talking to Taylor Bradford, as we do every week from the Gloucester Times. Hi, Taylor. Hey. Hi. So what's going on this week? I know it's a busy one. So it's a busy week. It seems like the city of Gloucester is ramping up as they're trying to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 here in the city. Um, so as of Wednesday, 40, 44 cases of COVID-19 were detected in the city. Now that's a jump throughout the entire week. Now Monday, the city reported 24 cases, 32 cases were reported on Tuesday, and then 44 this Wednesday. Um, the mayor had noted on her Facebook page and on the um, city's website that it was due to a large gathering or social event. Now, I've not been able to confirm what that event was, um, but because of all the cases, restaurants like the Azorian Seaport Grill, 1606 Restaurant, and Cape Ann Brewery have temporarily closed as they've all had a positive case within their staff. And so they are talking about reopening once they've been able to test all their employees, clean all the facilities, really try to make sure they do a deep dive to ensure that this won't happen again, or if when it does, um, they'll be able to really respond in a way um, that is effective um, and safe for everybody. So there seems to be a lot, and that's not the only places that are being affected. Some of the schools here in the district are also um, have had positive cases or isolated positive cases. So Gloucester High School had reported one and East Gloucester and Pathways all um, reported that they have. Um, it seems that the schools are taking the um, proactive approach and they um, have been contacting those who have been affected, um, letting people know. As of right now, it doesn't seem like they're changing their model of learning at all. But what it does look like is that they're really trying to communicate well within the district to all the parents and guardians and students to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Now, this is big for Gloucester High School because they just started their hybrid learning and went back to the physical buildings this week. So the first week back, you know, to get that email probably was a pretty hard thing. But um, it seems that, you know, the students had an opportunity to speak with a student yesterday and she talked about how it's very different, but it's good to be back in person and people are wearing masks and they're just trying to figure out this new sense of normalcy here in the city. Mm. So is anyone saying whether these are students or teachers? Is that? Well, that has not been published, nor will it be. Superintendent Ben Lemus told me that they're not going to release that information um, for the respective of the people involved. So I'm sure there is hearsay and talk and people probably have their speculations of who it might be as everywhere in the world deals with this. Um, but yeah, no, those things won't become public um, through the city and through the school. And what other, what are the exact measures the school takes when there's a positive COVID um, case in the school? Do the, is the whole classroom closed? Mm. Is, is, um, is everyone quarantined who's been in that classroom? Do you know what happens there? So what I can understand from my conversations with the administration and from the emails that they send out is that if you are not six feet it, the, the thing is close contact is, you know, six feet um, with the person who is infected for at least 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And so for 15 consecutive minutes. And so, you know, if you're not in close contact, you'll get one of these emails that says you weren't in close contact, but here's what the school is doing. There was a case. Now, I haven't seen the emails to those that have been in close contact, but what the other emails indicated was that those people are contacted and they're kind of given the next steps of what quarantine looks like. Um, they also do a super deep clean of the school buildings, trying to make sure um, that everything is sanitized and ready to go um, as they kind of clean things. And so that's what I can gather from my conversations and what they do. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of um, nitty gritty details to all of that um, that I, I'm just not privy to. But um, it does seem like the communication is kind of across the board and they try to make sure that each contact communication is very unique to each individual involved with this as this is new for everybody so I'm sure it's you know it's even new to the administration as they're figuring this out right and I know you don't cover the surrounding towns Taylor but there have been some tiny upticks in Rockford and Manchester uh, anyone sort of tying it to this same event any any feelings about that that you've heard not that I can know of um, again I am reaching out to the city throughout these couple days just to figure out what it might be um, but I mean when people do get um, together even when they're masked um, right we, we've talked about there's a lot of different possibilities for how the virus can be contracted and um, transmitted so you know if you're sitting and eating with a person and taking your mask off as Karen Carroll kind of indicated you know like the, the eating and eating a food eating a sandwich you know doesn't yeah. keep you, you know, protected from COVID, you know, you still have to wear your mask. So, um, but I have seen some unique um, mask um, styles. Yeah. There's a, a few musicians in the area who have uh, created these masks that have like their, 
they're the uh, disposable ones. They put them around and they cut a hole in the middle for their instrument and then they have a flap of cloth over it. So when you're talking, you're still covered, you're fine. And yeah. then once you need to play, you, you know, you slip your what? flute or your bassoon or whatever <laughs> instrument through the mask. And so you can still play and there's a stopper at the end of the instrument to kind of help with the, the transmission of the virus through the other end of the instrument. So people are getting creative here in the city. Um, I know some students had created, you know, that initiative of encouraging people to wear their masks. And I've definitely, when I do walk through the city, um, I, I see some very stylish masks these days. So I think people are getting creative and trying to be lighthearted. And I'm, I'm excited to see what masks look like, especially in the Halloween season, as we're getting right. close to Halloween, which I'm so excited. Right. Great, great holiday. So That's my favorite line so far is, what are you doing for Halloween? Wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, so speaking of Halloween, you have some good news for us, right? I do. So while things seem to be escalating here in the city, there are some really big highlights here for businesses and for kids getting a chance to snack either our Twix or Snickers um, at the end of October. So the Gloucester Police Department's Community Impact Unit um, has just um, announced that they're going to be doing a Halloween walkthrough down Main Street on October 29th. The uh, time is from 2 to 4. They're going to be closing down the street at 12 just to kind of get ready for the event. Um, but this is a chance for kids to get out, wear their masks. I heard a few city councilors might be showing up in some fun costumes. Um, so just a chance to like, you know, regather people and in a socially distanced way, um, you know, they're closing down the entire street so people can really distance. Kids aren't allowed inside the stores. Um, they're gonna have tables where you can grab snacks and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, they talked tentatively that they might need to cancel it depending on what it looks like here in the city. Uh -huh. So there is kind of that asterisk to the story but it you know it's one of those hopeful things that you know every kid deserves a chance to be able to have their their halloween costume of choice so um exactly yeah uh, we'll see. so yeah so that's an exciting thing but that's not the only exciting thing here in gloucester we talk about businesses and restaurants trying to um you know stay afloat um and there's one business that has seemed to do a very good job of that and that's wheelhouse co-work over on main street um they're a collaborative workspace that you know, their focus is in creating communities and providing spaces for people who either work at home, you know, before the pandemic, they either worked at home or they had that chance to kind of work wherever. And so they create this space where it's very community oriented. You have your desk, you can be, create this membership um, and they office, offer like office space for you to work. And it's very hip. It's, you know, it's not just a desk. They have things, they used to have things such as Muffin Mondays. They, you know, have this great community around their members. Um, and Nick Cahill, the founder, and I had the chance to talk yesterday. And so they, while they did have to close their, what he said is that their membership continued out and people were really dedicated um, to sticking with them. And even saw an uptick um, as they reopened. Um, in their memberships and so much so that they actually have to open up another space and this is something that Nick said that has been on his five-year plan for a long time but he says the opportunity to create a safe and welcoming space for those in here in the city but also people coming into the city to work you know they might go get food at one of the local restaurants or you know go buy a pair of shoes um, so really trying to help both the economy and the morale of the city so he's going to be opening up his second spot wheelhouse harborside um, over at 33 Commercial Street at the beginning of November is their scheduled start date. Um, and that, if people remember, is actually the former place of the Chamber of Commerce used to be housed up there. And so Nick says he's got a lot of really great things planned for that space. So it's going to be kind of a different feel from their um, wheelhouse main location. But they're going to have a lot of really fun opportunities, such as three different taps. So they're going to have a beer on tap, a kombucha, a cold brew. Once COVID things are a distant memory, um, they're so going to be for people to commute. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's talk about the ideal workspace where we're all yeah. stuck in our houses. So um, you got a little the, beach too. I know you have the beach. <laughs> you can watch the fishermen come in and out, and yeah, it's yeah. just ideal. So. Um, yeah, so that's going to be coming. Our story published on that on Thursday, and you guys can see more of that on our website to hear more about what Wheelhouse Cowork is doing to keep morale here in the city alive. So, well, I am a huge fan of both these workspaces and Nate Cahill. I think he's done a great job. And for people who don't understand the concept, it's just so amazing. It, let's say you work at home, you're a writer who works at home and their place is a mess and you need to have a meeting with, you know, a client. So mm -hmm. you can use that. They have office or meeting spaces also where you can, you know, professionally 
get together and um, if not just work there. It's really a great concept for these sort of independent contractors mm -hmm. who are moving about the world. And there's so many more of them these days. Right. And he says that, you know, they're not only sticking to the letter of the law of COVID regulations, but the spirit of the law. So for those who are curious to know, like, you know, how can I stay safe and also kind of join one of these places? Um, they have dividers, they have, you know, protocol and procedures in place to ensure people's safety. Um, and he says that most of all the local businesses in this area, you know, you have to be hyper aware of it because it is your job to keep people safe. Um, and so, you know, he talks a lot about, they have a very extensive protocol and they can only have 50% capacity right now um, because of it. So really trying to, and fortunately they did have to cancel muffin Mondays. I heard about oh. that, you know, they had to cancel their keto <laughs> snacks, but uh, they have a lot more to offer in both locations as the second one opens up later this year so that's great that's great well we will lo love to follow up with nate and you hmm. on how it's going well thank you so much for keeping us up to date on everything in gloucester this week it was a busy week you got a lot oh, done for <laughs> sure and i can't wait to speak with you guys next week have a great weekend okay you too take care bye bye I am here with Erica Brown, as we are every single week, and she is going to tell us what's happening in Manchester-by-the-Sea and Essex. <laughs> hey, well, we have really three things I thought I'd share with you. Um, the first one, we, we seem to be talking about sports a lot um, in the last several weeks because sports have kind of really come back. Well, they really, really are on fire in terms of just participation here in team. They're really engaged. And um, we've got some really great uh, sports coverage and things across country we talked about last week. We've got uh, girls field hockey is going like crazy and so is boys and girls um, soccer. But um, we did a focus this week on golf, the golf team. Uh, the Manchester Essex uh, golf team is really on fire. They're poised and they're looking to get a lead in their division. And they've had 13 matches, they've planned 13 matches within four weeks. Wow, they're busy. They're not. They're not in their Zoom classrooms. They're golfing. That's great. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, we um, Jason Brisboy did a great piece this week that focused on them. He talked to Hollis French, who's the coach, and really got into to it. It's a really great sport, especially during the pandemic. It's outside. You're distanced. It's really kind of it, it gives them a little bit of a break. So I really admire and uh, envy the golf team, the boys' golf team. But I have to say, they their home their, their home field here is the Essex County Country Club. Well, that's yeah. too bad. <laughs> so if I, I should show you the pictures. Or actually, I'll share them. The yeah. pictures they're taking. It looks like they're is it down in you know Pebble Beach or something. It looks like they're on the. <laughs> oh uh, well, that's great. And you said they're doing really well. Yeah, they right? are. Yeah. Yeah. They're really doing fantastic, and they're just uh, really excellent. So that was a really great. All right. Well, I think we're supposed to cheer very quietly from the sidelines for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go Manchester golf team. Yeah. The the second story I wanted to share with you um, is sort of a our you know a hometown kind of pride source. We we had the passing of Dr. Donald Cohn um, at 93 years old, but really vibrant, you know, man, and he was a real visionary and a scientist, and he was the founder of New England Biolabs. Are you familiar with New England Biolabs? Oh, yeah, everybody is around here. It's, it's a sort of a monolith of, in, well, industry and, and science, right? That's exactly right. I think, I, 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 I'm not an expert. He was a pioneer in molecular biology with, when it comes to tools that use DNA um, sequencing to actually do testing. Um, I think they call it recombinant DNA um, tools. Let's just call mm -hmm. it that. Yeah. Um, but in any case, he turned that insight and that expertise into a industry changing business um, that was very, very successful, continues to be very, very successful. And um, it's also connected to cell signaling, which is on 128 in Beverly, uh, New England Biolabs, I believe is in Hamilton. Um, but anyway, so he, he passed, he lived a really big life and we have his obituaries really, you know, very interesting read. I'd encourage anybody to read it. It's just a real wonderful thing. I love a good obituary, and he sounds like a real leader in the community, so I'm going to run right there. I have to say that, um, you know, local news a long time ago, newspapers started charging for obituaries um, that, you know, were submitted, and I know that that was a really important part of their revenue, and I know it's important. The Manchester Cricket has never charged for obituaries because we consider it a service to our community, and um, I got to say, it really makes a difference because... You have so great ones. <laughs> I go, I go right to the obituary section of your paper because they're so interesting every yeah. time. I mean, everybody's life is, more often than not, is really worth reading. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. So thank you for that. <laughs> and you have one more story about the holidays coming up, right? 
Yeah, it's just kind of a tease. It's sort of interesting that we're starting to think about it. Here we are in the middle of October. We're facing Halloween, and I know that there's some really interesting Halloween community efforts going on. It's usually what triggers any any community's kind of winter holiday uh, domino. The first domino to fall is Halloween. <laughs> well, <laughs> this week we had we held the um, the Cape Ann Chamber um, held its you know the Manchester Division meeting, which we're now turning into this kind of platform for business, local business, especially downtown businesses, um, to actually have a more, um, less formal, I'll call it, less formal interaction with town officials. One of the problems I think that, you know, you have as a business, you work all day, it's really hard to get to those meetings at night. It's hard to follow and track town um, business and town politics. And so these meetings, we had it uh, Wednesday morning, uh, by Zoom, it was really well attended, and we started to look at the challenge of what we're going to do in the season. You know, after Thanksgiving, um, once those Jersey barriers come down and the parking opens up a little bit, and looking at things like Christmas by the Sea, which is a weekend-long affair that starts with Santa arriving uh, with a lobster boat, and, and we have the holiday stroll, and we have all those things that all of, you know, our towns on Cape Ann kind of participate in. And there's a lot of, you know, pilot fish level parties that go around around them. So people right. use them to have their own little parties downtown. So we're starting to look at that and look at it creatively and get input. And that's really kind of an interesting thing. And it sort of signals the change of the season. Mm, so this is the chamber and local businesses are trying to figure out and how. Town officials. So we had the Board of Selectmen Chairman uh, Eli Bowling was there, Greg Fetterspiel, the uh, town manager, Todd Fitzgerald, um, you know, the police. So it's kind of well-rounded. Yeah, good, good. Well, we look forward to f seeing how that all works out in Manchester. And I know all the other towns are going to be looking at the same sort of issues because it's a whole new horizon for the holidays, right? Yeah, and it changes week by week, too. So yeah. we figure out over the next six weeks, we'll kind of get a picture of what it's going to look like. Right. Well, Erica Brown, thank you so much for keeping us up to date, and we'll see you next week. All righty. Bye, Heather. Great to Bye. see you.